Welcome to the World History One lecture series. At the end of each slide, there will be a 10 second delay. Use this time to pause the presentation and complete your notes. When you are done, push play and you will move forward. This lecture will begin in 5 seconds. Welcome to World History One, Lecture 5.1, Introducing Greece and Greek Philosophers. And where are we now in the cycle of civilization? Well, we learned that civilizations are established. We saw how civilizations develop, and we explored how civilizations sustain themselves. And in doing so, we found out that civilizations last a long time, and that long-lasting civilizations react by design to outside influences. And we looked at ancient China as a great example of this. Now we're going to study how civilizations develop differently. And in doing so, you will find out that geography is a major reason why civilizations develop differently. Differences in development can lead to unique cultural achievements. And we're going to use Greece as an example of how civilizations develop differently. With that said, go to the next slide. And now for something completely different. You see, we've studied seven civilizations up to this point. Mesopotamia, Egypt, Hebrew, Phoenicia, Persia, India, and China. And all of these civilizations are similar. But now we're going to study Greece, and that civilization is different. And it's all because of geography. So let's look at the geography of the civilizations that we've already studied to see why they are similar. Mesopotamia is on the Tigris and Euphrates River. Egypt is on the Nile River. The Hebrews, Phoenicians, and Persians live in areas that are either on or near the Nile or the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. India is on the Indus and Ganges rivers, and China is on the Yellow River and will eventually migrate into the Yangtze River. All of these civilizations are similar because they are located on rivers or in river valleys. Now let's look at the geography of Greece. What? Wait a minute. Where are the major rivers? Well, there are none. And Greece is not a river valley civilization. So unlike the other civilizations that we've studied, Greece will develop differently because of its geography. Go to the next slide. Since we're doing things completely different, we're going to look at Greece through the eyes of their philosophers. But before we start talking about Greek philosophy, we got to figure out where this place is located. So let's place Greece on a map. On this map, we're over here in North America. And we have some landmarks to use to help us place Greece. Africa is one. The Middle East is two. The Indian subcontinent is three, and China is four. Now we're going to add a new landmark, the continent of Europe, which is five. And Greece is that little red spot surrounded by the circle. Greece is on the continent of Europe. If we zoom in to that spot, we see this map, and you will see one major landmark that we relied on when studying ancient civilizations. That's the Mediterranean Sea. And there are other places that we've learned surrounding the Mediterranean Sea. Egypt, which is around from 2700 to 330 BCE. The Hebrews, they're done by 73 CE. Mesopotamia, 2900 to 331 BCE. The Phoenicians, 3500 to 300 BCE. And the Persian Empire, 631 to 330 BCE. Now we're going to add the Greeks. And Greece is around from 3300 to 146 BCE. What does that mean? It means, once again, they knew each other. 
they traded with each other, they fought each other, and some of them conquered the others. In next unit, we're going to learn about these guys, the Romans. Uh-oh. They're around from 753 BCE to 476 CE, and they'll eventually take over everything you see on this map. Go to the next slide. Now you can find Greece on a map, and we'll look more at the geography of Greece in upcoming lectures. But right now we're going to focus on Greek philosophy, because we're going to use these philosophers to look back into Greek history and see how it develops differently. And what you're going to see is that Greek philosophy is different than the Chinese philosophy you studied last unit. You already know that a philosophy is the rational investigation of the truths and principles of being, knowledge, or conduct. And for the Chinese, that meant a way of life. Live your life like it's always Taco Tuesday. But for the Greeks, it means more like, why are we here? Or, all we are is dust in the wind, dude. There are three major Greek philosophers you're going to learn about. Socrates, or Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And Greek philosophers will look back into Greek history to shape their philosophies. And there's a lot of Greek history to look back into. Early Greece starts around 3300 BCE at the dawn of civilization. We have the Persian Wars, which you'll learn about from 494 to 480 BCE. We have the Golden Age of Greece, which lasts from 460 to 429 BCE. And we have the Peloponnesian Wars, which you'll learn about, which lasts from 431 to 404 BCE. And our three Greek philosophers live at the end of this civilization from 469 to 322 BCE. From their perspective, they can really see how Greece developed differently. Go to the next slide. Let's look at the first of the three philosophers who will show us why Greek civilization develops differently. And his name is Socrates, but you know him as Socrates, who sought to understand and achieve virtue through critical inquiry. In other words, Socrates says you can't know anything else until you know thyself. You have to know who you are before you can know anything else. And to help people figure out who they were, Socrates used the Socratic method to ask his students questions so that they may find the answers on their own. Plato, who you're going to learn about in a second, is Socrates' most trusted student and he records his words. And this is really important. You see, Socrates dies from taking hemlock when he is sentenced to death for corrupting the morals of the miners. Apparently, the folks in charge of Greece at the time didn't like the fact that Socrates was getting his students to ask questions about themselves and about Greek civilization. Go to the next slide. Our next philosopher was a student of Socrates, so you can imagine he's a little upset about what just happened to his teacher. Plato believed in the idea of perfection, and that things on earth were simply imitations of the perfect example of that thing in the heavens. Salvador Dali sums it up as, have no fear of perfection, you'll never reach it. And that's how Plato feels about the world. Nobody's perfect, nothing is perfect, and the only things that are perfect are in the heavens. 
He comes up with this because Plato is deeply affected by the death of Socrates. And Plato's not done just with his philosophy. He founded the Academy, which is the first Western university, and he wrote a book called The Republic. The Republic is about government, and it concluded that only philosophers are fit to rule. Only philosophers are the perfect rulers. This is the first book on political science. Go to the next slide. So Plato is selling this idea of perfection and that you can never be perfect on earth. And one of his students isn't buying it. Aristotle is considered the father of modern philosophy. And his main ideas were as follows. There is a reality in physical objects that is knowable through experience. In other words, you gain first-hand knowledge by living in the natural world. Every time you interact with something, every time you touch something, every time you do something, you gain knowledge about that thing. The more you know, the better you become at something. That's pretty self-explanatory. And being your best represents perfection. Perfection is not something up in the sky that you can't achieve. It's whatever you are good at when you've reached your best, that's perfect. Aristotle, student of Plato, but he opposed many of Plato's teachings, and he addresses these issues in his book, Poetics, Rhetoric, Politics. And Aristotle is also the tutor or the private teacher of Alexander of Macedonia. You know him as Alexander the Great. And Aristotle was self-exiled. That means he leaves Greece after Alexander's death. That's it for this lecture, and I look forward to seeing you in class.